Back-to-back stops for the Bassmaster Elite Series in the state of Florida. John Garrett coming off a monumental win wire-to-wire at the Harris Chain and now going straight into a shortened practice for the St. John's River. That and more on episode 173 of the Inside Bassmaster Podcast. I'm your host, as usual, Ronnie Moore, my co-host, like always, Kyle Jesse. And Kyle, you are on the road going from Harris Chain to St. John's. You got to Palatka. We got a lot of stuff to do in a little bit of time, so I'm glad we're going to do a more condensed version of the podcast, but it's good to good to get one in with you before this tournament starts either way. Yeah, we, we always kind of discreetly complain about uh, the quick turnarounds because, you know, the back-to-backs or whether it be a, a elite to an open or a college to an open or an elite, whatever the case may be, we always discreetly kind of uh, fuss about it, but but yeah, this one's a really, really quick turnaround. When you're talking about leaving, uh, you know, the Harris chain to drive straight to the St. John's, um, you know, it's not a long drive. Obviously, it's an easy drive, but uh, it is a really, really quick turnaround. And and this is such a big body of water. I'm sitting here looking at it out my window if you're watching on YouTube or on Bassmaster.com. But um, it's such a big body of water. And so many of our elites have so much history on this body of water. But a lot of the guys have near none. So two days of practice is going to make it really challenging, um, regardless how much you know history you have on the body of water. But uh, certainly makes for some some head scratchers as far as fantasy fishing is concerned. And I know we're going to get into that later. Yeah, because we've got, you know, April is also a time period where you could become the St. John's River a ton, but it's April. So yeah. you may know areas that factor or play, but you really got to kind of relearn some of it. And then the way we just had the Harris chain one, that changed a lot of anglers thoughts. No doubt a shell bar a shell bed played for John Garrett three day four all four days of the event. And uh, people are automatically thinking uh, St. John's river shell bars. I'm going to go and graph a bunch and try to find and duplicate that, or at least have places to run around. But it is April. The spawn is still on. It is a river, so you're not going to just have fish in canal spawning. They'll be across the river. They'll be probably spawning in Rodman to a certain extent. You could go and fish deeper there. So a lot to cover for the St. John's. But before we do that, we got to give our flowers, the flowers that exist, to John Garrett because what a week it was at the at the Harris Chain of Lakes, the third stop of the Elite Series season. We saw the drama go down at the Harris Chain last fall for the end of the open season between JT Tompkins and John Garrett, who was going to win Angler of the Year for the Opens. And JT Best's John had a, had a really good event there. John had a tough day one, a really great day two, and came all the way back within 15 points. But JT wins AOI. And I think if John, you know, in the moment wanted to win AOI, for sure, you want to win everything. But if there was a trade-off and you'd say, well, later we're going to flip the order and it's going to be first and second at the Harris chain, which one would you take? He would no doubt take Elite Series champion more. So hundred grand at John Garrett and a second rookie win in a row and a dominant one, the first wire-to-wire Elite event win of the year. Obviously, Hamner won wire-to-wire for the Classic, but John Garrett, I posted it last night. You're a UFC fan. I'm a UFC fan. I had to post Nate Diaz. I'm not surprised, and I'll let you fill in the end of that quote because that that's exactly, I mean, it's the reason I picked him for Rookie of the Year. Uh, the adversities dealt with in the Opens, and I knew his quality and caliber of angler that he would put it together at some point, and boy, did he, and he's back in the hunt for ROI, and he's uh, he's up there now in AOI as well. It's weird to think, in, in a lot of ways, it's weird to think that John Garrett is a rookie because he's had so much success, consistent success, um, you know, through the Opens that when you look at it, obviously the amount of close calls, almost qualifying for the elites, you know, several times, that looks like a loss on paper. But when you translate that to like, if you were on the Elite Series and you were consistently that good, you'd be top, you know, top 20, top 10 in AOI every year. Like, it's really hard to like, you know, put that into words, but he has been so consistent, had so much success that um, when you look at him, he doesn't seem like a rookie. Obviously, the amount of success he had through the college series, the Opens, um, it is certainly not a surprise, like you said, to see him have success early on in his Elite Series career. Um, I think he would probably even tell you that getting a win that early on for anybody is just a crazy feat. So um, you could tell after weighing yesterday, he was just thrilled about it and just could not stop smiling and goofing off and that's you know as you know not necessarily him all the time he's a very even keel guy 
um, you know, he just I, I wouldn't say stays to himself, but more or less quiet in a lot of you know circumstances. And and he was just thrilled yesterday. So uh, congrats to John Garrett. Well deserved. I mean, just a really, really impressive performance being able to, uh, you know, make those fish last for four days and being able to kind of calculate where you needed to get your bites from. And then, you know, obviously on the last day, having some, um, you know, adversity, you know, that, that his main area, like he mentioned on stage, was taken over by Gar. And while I didn't cover him on the water, I noticed it in in the lake that he was in. Uh, there were gar everywhere, so it wasn't surprising to hear him say that. But, uh, you know, to be able to make an adjustment and, um, you know, come out on top by a, a large margin uh, was really, really impressive to see. It's the 14th instance in the, what is it, 18 years of the Bassmaster Elite Series, the 14th individual instance uh, where the elite winner wins by double-digit pounds, so over 10 pounds. 10 pounds, 9 ounces was his margin of victory, and so he joins a list and adds Harris, Harris Chain to a list of lakes as well. A bunch of individual lakes and then Lake Fork three times. That's basically that whole list is a bunch of different lakes uh, where somebody's dominated. And that that 24 pounds on day one was a huge step in the right direction, but then backing it up with 19 and 19 and then 21 on the final day, that's seven for so we, we were on Bass Live. We did three hours of Bass Live. So four hours into the day is when we caused, you know, called our halftime. Uh, live mix runs for an hour. You and Mercer hosted for an hour. And then we were back the last two hours. And I said at the end of our three hours in the morning, I said, I'm not worried about John, even if JT's having a great morning and catching up to him, because if when we return in two hours, if he's at the same weight, then I'll be worried. But this is the time of day where his bite starts to happen at some point, or he's going to, he refigures it out. And uh, boy, about 15 minutes before we came back on Bass Live, he catches a 7-4, and I got to feel, I was much more confident in his ability to close this out because of that one bite. And so that's the name of the game. Five minutes later, we see JT Tompkins, have one in a brush pile that he cannot get to swim out and he breaks it off. And uh, that one could have went blow for blow and been a seven or eight pounder as well. But John winning by 10 pounds, kudos. And uh, boy, the rookies, I think it's $500,000 that the rookies have uh, netted so far in three elite events, all, all 10 rookies combined 500 grand um, for three elites. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I'll <laughs> say uh, I, I'm gonna guess that's probably more than they got paid in the opens. And I'm I'm sure they're they're thrilled about that. So how much did you make the last first three elites? I think we I think we netted I think we netted five hundred thousand together. Me and you both in the first three elites for sure. Those three weeks of pay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just messing. Yeah, definitely. So um, <laughs> that that seven four going back to that fish catch that was really really awesome. Like we you know like you said so I got cool. To join uh mercer for bass live which was really cool in itself but getting to see that catch live as it happened was just i mean just amazing like there's no better feeling as a bass angler than setting the hook on a you know a single hook bait like like a jig or you know obviously he was throwing a hair jig and you know no movement back all you get is just a yeah. pump of the back it's like as long as that's not a catfish like that's a tank um that whole catch that sequence everything about it was awesome um, basically called his shot there, knowing that that was the fish that was going to win him the tournament. Obviously, uh, the quote, you know, about as big as the the trophy, it's going to win me. I mean, that oh, was, that's that's money. Every, everything about it was just awesome. Like that was, and you know, that's again, like John Garrett. You know, it's not like he's emotionless by any way, by any means. But like that's a good amount of emotion for John Garrett. Like you knew how he was feeling in that moment. Uh, you know, when he when he came out with that quote, so definitely a uh, an amazing catch and that'll be one throughout the course of the year that's a, a top catch and when you saw the glow of the fish on bass live like when he bows up with it and what's great is you know you've got other techniques that you can have big line on most of those sure. offshore would be dragon baits but this is a hair jig is a moving bait normally with a crank bait you might have you know 10 12 whatever to get it down to the depth you desire um, the only big line you normally have is dragon baits or when you're up close and personal up shallow and so you can run 20 to 25 on a hair jig if you really wanted to. And so just him, just, you can just see him bowed up on that fish. And it's just finally after three or four seconds, he starts winding on it. Cause it just, it just, uh, locked it up. And then when it swims by the boat and you see the glow 
and you're like, holy crap. Those at moments with the sun and the water clarity at times, there are certain lakes where it's just you see that fish glowing underneath there and you're like, this is crazy. And then he grabs it and it's obviously the winning fish. And so he catches a three pounder right later. He did that the day before as well. He caught a three and like a six on back to back casts, and he caught that seven and a three within the next five casts. So when they did roll into his area and he saw him on 360 and could decipher those are bass, he had to catch them because they could be gone in a moment. They continued to move. He said they really weren't fish that pulled up and and stayed. They kind of just perused, you know, the shell bar and shell bed, and then they made their way off. So he had to wait it out and be patient, but showed some veteran patience there. And, um, and man, that area, I'm pretty sure – will never be the same again because I'm pretty sure that's where Aaron Yavorsky won the team championship with his dad and then the fish off. And then I'm pretty sure that there was like a high school tournament that took 29 pounds to win like three weeks ago in that same region. And uh, it's a place that I think maybe even Wesley Gore had tried in the open at Harris Chain last fall and they just didn't bite on day two for him, but I'm pretty sure um, that's where it was. And so, or that general vicinity. So you your, can't really your, put your too dad, many. Go ahead. Your dad claimed that he found the spot. That's what he told oh, me. So, uh, he, he actually shucked so many oysters and was eating them on the boat. He just threw them back there. He made a shell bar. <laughs> My dad no. was, there was, there was, he was like the uns, unsung hero and star of Bass Live was my dad. Every local in the background yelling, or if someone was taking a video from their dock, it was, is that, is that Ronnie's dad? <laughs> So it was very cool. He was your boat driver. He certainly was. We had a good time, and uh, we're going to do it again here at uh, at the St. John's. So it, it's going to be a good time. But we had s several of the same instances on the water where, you know, we'd be talking to an angler, and, uh, you know, somehow, you know, people who connect you and I, obviously, together so often that, uh, like, for instance, one day with Joseph Webster, we we're sitting there talking, and he goes, he starts out the conversation. We start talking and he goes, he goes, what do you think Ronnie Moore is doing right about now? He said, he's got to be running his yapper or doing something. And, and I just started dying laughing. And then I, I, it never clicked. Like immediately I was like, Ronnie's dad is sitting five feet from me. So I was like, I really <laughs> hope he doesn't say something negative about Ronnie. But then he goes on to say like, Ronnie Moore has been so good to me, yada, yada. And I was like, well, <laughs> ironically, Ronnie's dad's right behind us. So you can thank him. <laughs> That's so, hilarious. Uh, it was it was funny. There were some funny instances where stuff like that happened, but uh, but we had a good time. And like you said, we are rolling to the next one. Yeah. So it's gonna be a short podcast. I gotta go. You gotta go. It's been a jam packed day. So let's jump right into the St. John's River and uh, kind of I guess keyed up on Rapala Bassmaster Fantasy Fishing and Falcon Rods Drain the Lake. And so when we think about the St. John's River. You've got 110 miles of river. You got Rodman. You can also, you know, factor in. It's been one in the last couple of years up closer to Jacksonville. Um, it's been one at the mouth of Lake George on the north end. It's been one in the river and Rodman combined, you know. So, and then it's also been one at the bottom of George where it kind of, uh, or I guess where it flows in from Dexter. And so it's been one in multiple different regions. This place has changed a lot over the years, but. Um, they've been working hard to try to get grass back. I don't know how much it's taken. I'm not going to try to act like an expert if there is a heavy contingent of grass anymore in places, but we do know the one thing the St. John's river does have is shell bars. It does have lily pads. It's got the canal systems that you can definitely catch fish around. It's got riprap areas, um, on the way to locks and things like that. And Rodman's got the standing timber. It's got so much to offer there as well. Um, and then also docks. Docks have been a thing that we've seen start to factor more and more because those shallow fish don't have much cover. So how are you thinking about the St. John's River? What's the weather down there right now? Because I'd expect still some be some fish on bed. You're going to have those fish starting to group up offshore. There will probably be a shad spawn deal. And for those who don't know, shad spawn happens on those shell bars offshore as well it's not just visibly on the bank so someone's going to get right in the in a good bend in the river where some hard spots and shell bars are and and they're going to be chomping and you're going to be able to bring a swim bait through or something else you know and be able to catch these fish lipless yeah I, I would say all those things you mentioned obviously will certainly all be factors but that's the one thing i kept going back to is Naturally, the Harris Chain and, and the St. John's are completely different bodies of water in a lot of ways, but 
you know, what we just saw at the Harris chain, a lot of guys were able to have success just fishing the bank, you know, just fishing, like, you know, just fishing can mean a lot of things these days. Some people say just fishing uh, is anything not using forward facing sonar. To me, just fishing is pretty much going down the bank and fishing visible cover. Um, you know, we saw a lot of guys have success doing that at the Harris chain. We've seen a lot of guys have success doing that here in the past, even earlier in the year. So I think that that will certainly be a factor, but you mentioned shell bars. Uh, there's been tournaments in the past where I've seen guys, um, you know, like Buddy Gross one year, I got in the boat with him and were, was able to shoot content and that's what he was doing. I think there's a good bit of that to be had. Um, and I think that, of times. Yeah, absolutely. I've covered him on the water doing it. Like, I mean, if you want to talk about somebody who knows where they're at, like that guy knows where they're at. And we ran all over the place following him at uh, every single show bar. But, uh, yeah, I think a lot of those things, all those things you mentioned will factor. Um, it just depends on what's going to be the predominant one to, you know, allow somebody to win. You know, if it's the bigger quality bites are going to be had shallow and it takes more of a grinder's approach. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys that you can justify doing that. A lot of guys that are going to be doing the shell bar deal. And, you know, if there's a, a good enough number of fish out on those shell bars, that's obviously something that's going to be um, potentially really consistent over the course of four days. So, that's what I would say. It's very warm outside. It's been a nice day today. Um, the first day of practice has been warm, sunny. I mean, just about a picture perfect day, as you can imagine. Um, and, you know, I, I'm interested to hear some of the practice reports that guys have. Um, at the Harris chain, we heard so many reports of it sucked so bad and the fishing was awful. And, it, you know, it was it, it was tougher in a lot of ways. It was a grind, overall yeah, for sure. Weight, yeah, overall weights were certainly – um, the, the cut weights were much lower than they've been in the past. The top weight beat out last time we were here and second almost beat out, you know, it as well. So, but yeah, it is, it is always skewed when someone catches them big, but there seemed to be a bunch of one to one and three quarter pound fish at the Harris chain show up compared to the two and a half to three pound fish. And uh, so those were gold. And then obviously big fish showed up. We saw every day we had four to six, you know, seven pounders on day one. You had a uh, eight, seven on day two that showed up. You had a nine and a 10, eight on day three. And then on day four, a seven, four for the winner. Um, so there were some big fish, but yeah, it was feast with big ones or famine yeah. with small ones. So, yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm sure there'll be a, a lot more of that uh, here at the St. John's river, as far as, you know, um, you know, guys catching really big ones, but obviously I don't think it's going to be a deal where guys are catching a, a great number of five plus pounders. So, It'll be the guys that, you know, obviously can find a consistent bite. And who knows, the shell bar deal like John Garrett found could be similar. Uh, it'll just kind of determine on how many there of you know, how many of them there are to fish and and within running distance. And um, there's a lot of factors that go into it. And just like the Harris chain, you and I talked about, like, I don't really know what to expect. Like, I know what to expect to a degree, but like it could go any any of those ways that, you know, you mentioned. And I wouldn't be surprised by any of them. So that's yeah. kind of like these tournaments fun. And the big twist before we pick our teams, 500th BASS event for Rick Clun. 50 years of professional fishing and uh, 500th BASS event. Congratulations to Rick Clun. We're documenting it all this week. He's going to get a camera on day one. He'll have a camera every day that he's eligible in this event. Um, we may even DQ people just to get him in like the cut or in top 10 or something, you know. But no, uh, we'll... We're going to follow that because that is something that may and most likely will never happen again. Very cool. And it's a place he's won in 2016, a place he won in 2019. And uh, I think he fished there all the way back in 1974. So the fact that, you know, his first year fishing, I believe he fished the St. John's at some point. And then um, now he's got a... Uh, um, his 500th event is going to be at that same body of water. Very cool. And so if you're in the Florida area and you want to witness history, show up for the weigh-ins and the takeoffs. It'll be very cool to see, and you'll be able to watch him on Bass Live when he's uh, competing in the event. But, Kyle, uh, let's jump in to Rapala Bassmaster Fantasy Fishing. I'm going to give you my five, and you give me your five, and then we'll go through each bucket and explain it real quick, uh, a little shorter than we may have. Hopefully we line up on a few of them so we don't have to talk extensively and we can trade off reasonings. But – I've got bucket A through E, Patrick Walters, Tyler Rivette, Drew Cook, Brandon Cobb, and Cliff Prince. We share three of the same picks. I wow. have 
I have Patrick Walters, Brandon Lester, Drew Cook, Wes Logan, and Cliff Prince. Oh, good. We alternate. We got we got A, C, and E all the ma- all match, and our B and Ds are um, different. But man, Patrick, I'll just go you and know, jump into it. Whether they've been sight fishing, flipping, uh, hard spot fishing in turns of the river, Patrick's done well in Florida. Um, every time we've started the season out there, I'd expect April will actually like play to his favor a little bit more and allow him to move around some, even though you don't want to run around too much. I think that he's got plenty of history fishing pieces of structure that could factor this week. So it's one of those things. He doesn't have to go seek out that cover. He knows where some of it is. He can check to see a fisher on it. And then boom, I've already got, I've got some security and safety that I've got a couple spots and now I'm going to try to find some others, but he could be a guy who goes to Rodman and throws for a loop. But I think that whether he goes down and fishes in inches of water flipping or he is um, uh, in the river, you know, off the bank. I I think Walters needs a bounce. I'm going to say bounce back because he missed the cut at Harris Chain, but he's still in bucket A. So he's not really you know, full bounce back, but I think that uh, he's definitely going to have a chance to to really improve his odds. I think this really lends, two days of practice really lends to the guys who have experience here. I think it is right in Cliff Prince's alley, and we'll get to that in a couple minutes. But um, Patrick Walters, bucket A, for those reasons. Same for me, uh, you know, last bit, bit of information, you know, four Bassmaster Elite Series tournaments, top 10, every single one of them. I mean, that's kind of hard results to argue with. And uh, Patrick Walters is so versatile, like you said, um, hard to justify not picking him in bucket A. Every bucket, I would say, and and we can talk about this, I feel like was very dispersed. There are a, There are multiple, multiple, multiple good options in each bucket, you know, for the body of water. Uh, the Harris chain, at least for myself, was I felt was a little harder to pick some buckets. It was um, a grind. Yeah, there was it was just hard to predict what was going to happen, you know, like fishing wise, and then you know guys' history there, and it, it was hard to predict. But I feel like it was really well uh, well versed this uh, this go around. But in bucket B, who you got? You mentioned. Uh, I said Tyler Rivette. I think uh, it lends itself to that jerk bait bite uh, offshore, finding a group of fish, live scope. He already caught a crappie or a crappy. Why did I say crappie? I never said he caught a sockele, as he would call them, uh, already on day one of practice. And so I uh, fully expect him not only to have dinner for the week, but uh, maybe stumble upon something else. So I think that Rivette um, was – he was doing similar things as guys like Trey McKinney were at Harris chain and he just didn't net the result nearly that Trey did. And so I think that that train of thought could bode well for him this week. And uh, it's really the wild card is going to be, I guarantee you there are anglers who won't even fish the St. John's river. There are anglers who have, will spend both practice days in Rodman and they will not fish. They will not have practiced the river because that's where they expect to go. And that's where it lines up for them. So we'll see if, Rivette, that could change your picks totally. I'd still stick with him if he did that, but it is if forty guys go to Rodman, uh, it's gonna be a oh, it's gonna be a tough decision on how populated it is and getting first dibs on spots and stuff. So we'll see. Um, who was your bucket B? Bucket B, Brandon Lester. Uh, Brandon Lester might be from Tennessee, but I mean his results in Florida would make you think he's a local to. Uh, to these bodies of water. I mean, he's had such great success across the entire state of Florida. Um, good results at the, at the St. John's river. Um, I made my picks last night, so there was no percentages. If you, if you've ever picked made your picks the night that the buckets you changed, set the percentages, it went a hundred percent because one person had picked a guy like you, you, you were the one who changed the percentages. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, there was none on there, which I kind of liked because a lot of times I play the percentages and do things. And I, you know, still did that to an extent, but uh, Brandon Lester was, is the heaviest percentage pick there in uh, bucket B and for good reason. I mean, there's, there's a lot of good anglers in bucket B you could justify going with, but uh, Brandon Lester is so consistent in Florida. Um, again, just like Walters. I mean, any way it plays out, you feel like he's, he's going to be right in his wheelhouse. So uh, bucket B for me, wasn't too, too difficult to pick with Brandon Lester. So Lester, to to emphasize your point, 24 BASS events in Florida. He has 14 top 40s, uh, which is the opens, you know, is the old opens check line, but it's now 45. And then um, 
and obviously Elite Series events factor in that as well. And then he has nine top tens. It would have been 10 out of 24 for top tens if he didn't finish like 11th. I think he got 11th or something like that, and so or 12th. And uh, so Lester almost did that. I think he broke. He has 24 BASS events across Opens and Elites and has broke the $200,000 mark in this state. Uh, without an elite win in the state is is great results for the amount of tournaments you fished um because because you know opens checks are just different than elite checks so uh kudos to brandon and yeah he i'm glad he got his season going right um he's in bucket b c we both agreed on cook i got a feeling that uh i've you know, we started to see some sight fish, some cruisers. KJ Queen, you know, did very well and dominated his game plan with that at the Harris Chain. Some anglers caught the biggest fish of the tournament doing stuff like that. I feel like you can do – I feel like we'll have more spawn going on at the St. John's than we did at the Harris Chain. And so uh it lends it to itself to cook. Uh, swim jigging could be a deal for him too. He's balanced the lake and the river in the past. I, past, I think, um, cook in Florida. It's one of those things I feel – Benton's great at the St. John's too, but I feel like Cook. I don't. Cook could be a better pick, and then at the Harris Chain, Benton does better than Cook does notoriously. You know that kind of thing. I feel like that's the the balance of these two lakes. But yeah, Cook for bucket C for me. And I didn't yeah. look at percentages, even though I picked it later than you. Um, I picked them based on I like my lineup of guys with or without percentages, but I do think <laughs> I do think I've got like one. Uh, I think I've got like three buckets where I have the second most picked guy, but that was uh, sheerly just – there was a couple guys I had in mind I'm picking no matter what bucket they're in. I hope they're not in the same bucket, and so they end up being um, – I feel like we both did that. <laughs> Walters, yeah. Cook, and Prince. I don't know what buckets they're in, but whatever it is, I'm going to – I'm locking them in. 100%. And at 5.4%, it's like – how? I mean, like if you were talking about percentages, like that's Drew Thank Cook and – Thank, thank good it said, uh, I think it says Georgia. Yeah, thank goodness it says Georgia on his thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So, uh, yeah, I'm right there with you. I think Cook also, just like my first two picks, very versatile. Um, and all those reasons you mentioned were spot on as well. That's that's exactly why I was going to go with him as well. I really like him, Bucket D, Cobb. Man, if you're around the spawn or around the shad spawn, I like Brandon Cobb. Um, I That's that's my my reasoning. Um, not because of any inside info. I never base my picks off of that, but more so I just, this is like we said, Kyle Welcher. Um, we've said this in past podcasts. I feel like Kyle Welcher and Brandon Cobb fish very similar. So if you feel Welcher could do well, Cobb could do well. And so I, that's the same train of thought as, um, whether it's a top water bite, whether it's, uh, you know, fishing on the edges of cover, maybe it's the mouth of canals or it's in the river or it's sight fishing or shad spawn in the morning. I like Cobb, and I also don't think that Cobb's like – not saying I don't want to risk, but I don't think he's going to be like, I'm putting all my eggs in Rodman's basket. I think that like he plays it smart, and I think that that will net him well, and it will be good to get him out of bucket D and maybe bucket C after this event. Yeah, I'm right there with you on that. That's a, that's a solid pick. Uh, obviously, in bucket D, I had Wes Logan. Uh, Wes got off to a pretty pretty slow start the first two events. Um Made the cut there at Harris Chain. I think that positive momentum, something to build off of, you know, it just just making a cut obviously is a, a huge step in the right direction. And uh, Wes has done really well at the St. John's River. Uh, obviously told you the story before with John Cruz. What's um, a tide? Wes Logan. But I just think that like him just fishing on this lake, because I, you know, I, I've watched him on the water just in passing. I don't think I've ever necessarily covered him, but seeing what he's doing and things like that out on the water. And it's just like, he's just fishing. And it seems like this time of year, when you consider what we just saw at Harris Chain, there was a lot of that. Um, I think that there will be a lot of that again. Um, and, you know, same thing you mentioned, swim jig, all the, the, the you know, things that he excels at uh, could certainly play a big factor. And, and uh, you know, in the past, at least has been a guy that, you know, does fish the river a little bit, um, which as far as just spending time fishing and not running bodes well. Um, so I'm going... Wes Logan and Bucket D. Uh, I just was responding to a tweet that I didn't uh, – from somebody saying, hey, I just noticed on stage Trey McKinney at the Harris Chain mentioned he was one minute late, and that one pound cost him two spots. I said, yeah, that's what we talked about on Bass Live when he realized, oh, shoot, it's 157. I got to go in. And uh, he was one minute late, and he 
when instead of finishing fourth, he finished sixth because of that one pound penalty. So I actually talked to Trey and I said, that's your one, that's your one penalty you're allowed. You know, the next one will actually cost you like a win or something, or the sixth fish penalty will cost you more, but um, that's not, not easy, but yes, sorry. I was responding to that tweet saying, yep, that's, that's how it happened. Uh, bucket E, we both agreed on Cliff Prince. Man, I feel like uh, you need, like, I, I feel like when it's cold and they're not spawning, we were saying the shell bars were going to line up for Cliff Prince, and they did most of the time. He's had a great track record here in his home body of water. But then I feel like now that they're through some stages of spawn, the shell bars are going to be even better because those fish will be more apt to bite. I feel like that's, he's got, and the big thing, like I mentioned earlier, two days of practice. Um, you're coming out of a back to back. I'm not saying anything, but the two days of practice after a back, at, you know, after the first tournament, you're not fishing nearly as hard in practice as you probably are the first two days of going into the back to back swing. So yeah. you're gonna, people are going to have to just keep their head in the game and practice. I feel like Cliff already knows plenty of places and he needs to see something good from one of them for it to translate to another one in bucket E I'll take it. Uh, you never know when it's going to be your last time to fish. We always say this, you the last time to fish your home body of water on an elite event. But uh, I really feel like that could, it's going to pay dividends for him this week. Sure. Yeah. And I think that there's a handful of guys we've mentioned like Lee Livesey at four cliff Prince at uh, St. John's river. There's, there's more than that, but, it's like no matter what bucket, what percentage they are, it's like you you can't justify not picking them. Um, and like you said, it being a different time of the year, I think as soon as the schedule came out, you could look at that and be like, man, that should play into Cliff Prince's advantage just based on the fact that, you know, how many days has he fished this body water in the month of April? You know, as a touring professional, probably oh, less yeah. than have otherwise, but um I'd say know, that I'd say that he's experience. fished I'd say that he's fished more this time of the year at home than he would have um in january because you have the month off limits so those off february limits, events yeah. yeah he's not fishing in january or february ever unless it's an elite event and so i feel like uh the april he kind of may maybe gets to come home after elites and he's right down the street agreed yeah i mean it's hard to justify not picking him but bucket he's a tricky one too because you have john cruz obviously has a just a plethora of got a couple winners in this bucket yeah rick clun i mean Look, I'm just gonna say this: you like, got Gerald Swindle at three percent in Bucket E as well, and Scott Martin's in Bucket E. Like Buddy Gross, you've got some Florida. Wait, well, who is it? Joey Safuentes almost won at the uh, Kissimmee Chain. Brandon Lester beat him. Rick Clun's won here. John Cruz has won here. You've got uh, Buddy Gross, who's won in the state of Florida and is great at offshore shell bars. You have. Uh, Scott Martin from Florida. You have Bernie Schultz from Florida. You have Gerald Swindle, who's won in the state of Florida and also um, is such a big name. I'm surprised he didn't draw more than 3%, but we still have a day or so until they lock. Yeah, yeah. Bucket E is, is full of of names you could easily see, not just doing well in the tournament, but even winning the tournament. So, um, you know, it's still so early on in the season. It's not super unusual to see guys get off to the slow starts, but uh, – yeah, Bucket D is a tricky one because there are a handful of guys. If Cliff Prince was like in Bucket D, it would make it much more interesting because uh, <laughs> all those guys would be like so leveled out because, you know, you could justify any of those guys doing well. But uh, Cliff Prince being in Bucket E for me was enough to enough to just stick with him. Yeah, it is weird to see like the Polonics in Bucket D at this point in the season. Um, the Swindles in E. Uh, Hackney was in D before the last event had a had a top, you know, top 13 and pulled himself into bucket C, so and he'll be one to watch as well. Uh, who were some guys that you maybe considered picking in a, various buckets that you didn't pick, but you still have a good feeling about? We'll throw a couple good feelings out there. Yeah, so um, starting yeah. in bucket A, uh, you know, Trey McKinney, obviously, you know, for the same reason I was, I you know, we you and I had talked about early on in the season, I was just going to ride with Patrick Walters every single time in bucket A until he proved me wrong. Because <laughs> last year, my whole experience with, uh, you know, Brandon Cobb, just thinking like, well, if I pick him this time, this is going to be his one bad tournament. And he just kept doing well, kept doing well, kept doing well. I was like, what am I doing? Like, why am I not picking the guy with the hot hand? When you uh, stopped yeah. picking him and then he's done bad. So you need to get back on the train with me. I just I picked know. him this I'm, week. I'm I'm right there with you. So um, Trey McKinney, for the same reason, obviously it's hard to to argue with the uh, momentum. He's got bucket B. Matt Airy was one that I considered a lot. Obviously picked him at Harris Chain, had a tough day too, but 
Um, Matt Aries had some really solid finishes at the St. John's River. Um, bucket C. Uh, I actually went with your boy Jake Whitaker in Bucket C. Um, does really well in Florida just in general. Um, has has done well here at the St. John's, excluding I want to say one tournament he had that was was not the best. But other than that, has has been well within the cut every time. Um, that would be a you know a lower percentage guy that you could get away with. Um, and then you know we talked about Bucket E. It is full of guys, but something is telling me like. Rick Clun, just the way he is, like something crazy is going to happen. Like, I just have that feeling. It's not hard to see because of how well he's done at the St. John's in the past as it is. But, I, I mean, I just wouldn't be surprised if if uh, Rick Clun pulls pulls something crazy out of his hat and, and is able to, you know, have a, you know, extraordinary finish here again um, in his 500th event. So those would be some guys I would say, uh, you know, I considered picking as well. Yeah, I think, uh, and I won't give reasons for it, but I think a Stetson Blaylock and Wesley Gore in bucket A were guys I was looking at and and keyed on for a minute there. I like your Lester pick in bucket B. He was somebody that I was going to consider as well. Bucket C, um, Whitaker, uh, and then I think who's the other one that's in this bucket that I was considering. If If you don't have anything against Steve Kennedy, I think this could be a good Steve Kennedy event to pick him in. Um, but I've already sworn off him and Carl in fantasy. And so I have to just, and that's not because they're bad. It's just every time I pick them, it's bad for me. So, but then they do well, the next one, it draws me back in. So I had to swear them off. Um, D I think, um, where's he at? Uh, I think Todd Otten could do a good with, could, could do this good this week as well. And then bucket E I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'll throw a name out there. And this is just hopes and prayers. Uh, Bob Downey, he's on the baby pattern more than anybody because the baby's still fresh from the womb. Um, just last week had his first child, missed the Harris Chain event, and uh, then he came down and he was practicing as of Tuesday for day one of practice. So Bob Downey might be channeling some, hey, baby does need new shoes now. No, I'm I'm a father. You don't need to put shoes on your baby till they're, couple months old but maybe maybe needs new diapers no doubt um let's go to falcon rods drain the lake we pick our i pick our my team at the beginning of the year before these things lie out and so i'm always interested how it transpires i really like my team based on what this forecasted and projected deal could be um i'm gonna go ahead and rattle off my first four i'm actually gonna rattle off ones that uh agree and coincide with my fantasy fishing team um, I'll go ahead and say Benton in my first four, Swindle, Cliff Prince, and Tyler Ravette. So I have Prince and Ravette doubling up from my five man to my um uh Falcon Rodge drain the lake. So Benton, Swindle, Prince, and Ravette, my first four. Uh yeah, I'll do the same thing. My first four, I've got two that, that coincide with my Rapala team. Uh Wes Logan, Cliff Prince. Wesley Gore and Logan Latuso. You made a mention to Wesley Gore a minute ago, and I, I felt like this would be a, a good one. You know, nice. in the back of my mind with the Alabama swing, it's like you hate to to burn any Alabama. Yeah. But when you look at how many of them there are, and then you look at fishing styles in general and the time of year those tournaments are, it's like, I you know, I, how much you even really considering like the Central Alabama guys like massive favorites in that tur- those tournaments, um, not because they're not capable. It's just like, you know, I would have more confidence in him if it was fishing the Kusa, you know, pre-spawn or spawn, or, you know, I think it's going to be a lot Wheeler of and Smith are just, play. just different than where they're from. Perfect. A lot of these anglers, you Perfect. know, so. um, well, I've got for my last four, I've got Kyle Patrick, Brandon Polinick, Bill Lowen and Bob Downey. And I know it might shock some people for the first time ever. I'm using Brandon Polinick before the small mouth swing, but I think that the, he's still very capable up North. I think it's just changed a little bit with the technology on how other people are also now becoming very good at smallmouth. So I think you can now pick Brandon elsewhere. And I think that um, his fight with Florida is a February deal. He did terrible at the Harris chain, so he can't do terrible in both of them. He's going to have to do good here, which I already had picked him prior no matter what. But Kyle Patrick, Brandon Polinick, Bill Lowen, and Bob Downey. Yeah, to finish out my roster, I've got, Ed Lofren, Mark Menendez, John Cruz, and Rick Clun. We're going old school with the uh, the final four there. All guys that have had a lot of success. Um, 
John Cruz will be probably mad that I, I you know, reference him amongst uh, some guys that are, you know, of greater age than him. Uh, but guys that have had a lot of experience here, not only experience, but also um, success. So um, it just always has lended its hand to guys that fish old school, you know, in technique and pattern and the way that they fish. So, um, you know, obviously different time of the year, but I just think there's going to be some more of that happen this go around. So, um, like I said, Rick Klon, John Cruz, Mark Menendez, Ed Lofren, Logan Latuso, Wesley Gore, Cliff Prince, and Wes Logan are going to finish out my Drain the Lake roster. I'll repeat my eight again as well. Benton, Swindle, Prince, Patrick, Rivet, Polinick, Lowen, and Downey. I don't know. While we were making picks, I just kept thinking we haven't mentioned Crescent Lake yet. And Crescent hasn't gotten any love lately. Only guy who normally survives from there is somebody old school in nature. It's going to be a... Um, and the uh, Masayuki Matsushita did well there a few years ago in Crescent. Uh, Mark Menendez has has time and time again done well in in waves and periods. Maybe it's a day here, a day there. Um, if there is a shad spawn, how many cypress trees and hard cover there is in Crescent? Oof, I, I it could just be, it could just be swim jig, spinner bait, buzz toad season um, in there. Um, that's just that's just the fisherman and me just thinking about I juicy said, spots, how I'd be like, I need to go check that, man. <laughs> I said Mark Menendez, and your head just went straight to Crescent Lake, didn't straight it? Straight to Crescent Lake. I can just see it in the the come here, 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 come here. I got you, catch. You know, he's he's always he he almost won the one that Clon won a few years ago. Um, what's the weight this week? I was barely off at the Harris chain. I had 85 and it was 84. Thank you, John. Because otherwise I would have been uh, I would have been eleven pounds off if if second was the winning weight. Oh man. As far as winning weight this go around, I'm 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 gonna say obviously it's gonna take less than the Harris chain, would be my guess. Um I'm gonna say in the seventies. I got seventy three ten. Okay. You're a little you were three pounds lower than me at the Harris chain. And uh, you're three pounds lower than me here. I got 76.15. So we'll probably have the winning weight somewhere. If you're locking it in and you want that tiebreaker, lock it in at 74 and three quarters because that's right between Kyle and I. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, this is not like the Harris chain where in the past we have been historically 30 pounds off. We've, Whoa, I feel like we've been, we're on a good track been, now. We're on a good pretty, track. Yeah. Pretty close. So as far as winning weight's concerned, we're doing pretty pretty solid here. I think the only weight we've been egregiously off of is uh, I was nine pounds heavy at Toledo. I had 109, and it was 113, so eight pounds and change. I think I was like 18 pounds light or 15 pounds light for, for fork, and then uh, right there within a pound of uh, the classic, I think. And then within a pound of the hair chain. So we're back, baby. We're back. We are back. And that is a uh, factual That's the podcast. That's the and podcast. It's gonna be, like we said, it's happening now. Like Kyle is- Jesse made his Bassmaster live debut for an hour the other day. Let's give it up. How was that before Woo! we end the podcast? It was fun. I enjoyed it a lot. I, I appreciate Dave Mercer a ton for asking me to be on there. Um, you know, funny just going from, uh, you know, an intern at JM and working behind the scenes and doing that for a couple of years to uh, getting to, you know, speak on camera during Bass Live. It was it was a weird experience hearing Michael Middleton come through my ear and me being the one delivering all times. Yeah. Delivering the, uh, you know, the substance during the show or helping out with Dave anyways. And uh, it was really fun. I enjoyed it a lot. And hopefully at some point I get the chance to do it again for sure. Awesome. Well, our camera list, I believe, is set. It is going to be, let me see if I can do this off the top of my head. We got Rick Clun, of course. We've got our AOY leader, Trey McKinney. And then we've got Cliff Prince, John Cruz, Drew Cook, John Cox. Cox, Cruz, Cook. And then we've got Prince, McKinney, and Clun. So um, it's going to be a good day one Bassmaster Live. A lot of guys with success here, a lot of guys with knowledge of here, some historical figures for sure. And then the youngest angler in the Elite Series who happens to be leading angler, progressive angler of the year, and Dakota Lithium rookie of the year. So we'll bring you all the coverage Thursday through Sunday. 
Kyle's on site there bringing great photos, hanging, having some good times there in person. Bassmaster Live will be rolling, and uh, ideally we don't get postponed here. That would be fantastic because I felt like the Harris chain went 19 days long, even though it's just one extra day. But um, waking, up at, waking up at 4.30, 5 o'clock, it'll, it'll date you. You're like, man, we've been doing this for a while. But um, awesome. Episode 173 in the books. We gave you kind of like an abbreviated one I for the folks at home – online listening we gave you a brandon cobb weather one uh i promise i'll do that again if we get postponed but i hope we don't get postponed so um until next time we'll regather be safe and enjoy bass fishing for what it is peace <laughs>